stand for a reading from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. But turning, but, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who, will save their who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory to his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Lord. He had lost his mind. The disciples were sure of it. And maybe he had. It was another thing he was willing to lose. All this rambling about losing and saving and taking up your cross, it was getting a bit confusing. And they thought Jesus had lost his mind. And he had lost his mind, you see. He had lost his mind for anything else than what God planned for him. He had lost his mind for what he referred to as human things and preferred to, spo to focus on divine things alone. He had lost touch with reality. That is, if it was a reality that was anything else than the reality of God. And he had lost interest in anything other than the daunting path ahead of him. This surrender to suffering was confusing to Peter and the disciples. It just wasn't very profitable. They had stomached the constant healings of the uninsured and the free food distributions to the hungry. But when was this Messiah going to start making more sense? When would he stop all that dreaming and come back on down to earth with them? Fishing for actual fish, you see, would have been much more profitable than fishing for men. But Jesus had all these other ideas about what it meant to live a successful life. It was hard to follow someone who always had one foot on earth and one foot in heaven. It made following feel more like an awkward two-step dance. Why was he always asking them to give things up? And these were good things, you see. Things like security and wealth and a plan. Comfort zones, tradition, power. Why would he ask them to give those things up? It was a less is more mentality that Peter didn't really buy just yet. Why wasn't he invested in the political powers of the day? Why did he heal people for free? 
Why wasn't he wealthy? Why wasn't he concerned with keeping the good graces of the Pharisees? What on earth was he thinking? It seems he wasn't thinking on earth. He was dreaming from heaven. What a different way of existing. Even though the disciples had dropped their fishing nets a few months back to follow him, they had not yet dropped their expectations about who this Messiah would be and all that he would ask of them. And I think Peter found it unnecessary for Jesus to die and live a life of such suffering. The Messiah? A martyr? Surely not. And even if this was indeed the truth, such truth was too impolite to discuss in public. It was more of an offline conversation. But what Peter couldn't quite get What none of the disciples could grasp is that Jesus was not the Messiah they expected. Faithfulness in following Christ, you see, would mean losing something, even losing him. He wasn't the Messiah they thought they wanted, but he was the one they desperately needed. They needed his true abundant life, even if the profit margins of his startup company were seemingly small. He cared more about people than he cared about profit. And the disciples kept expecting Jesus to live up to their own ideals of power. And he kept asking them to give up their power to save their souls. But saving other things was so much more fun. And while they kept following him from village to village, they were starting to realize that there were some destinations that they wouldn't be following him to. We still don't want to follow a Messiah that asks us to give things up. Why would we do that? Yes, sure, we'll follow you, Jesus, but can't we keep everything that's important to us? Pretty, pretty, please. We want Jesus to have a high net worth. And even if he doesn't have one, we don't want him to ruin ours. As Americans especially, we seem to think that the more belongings we have, the more we ourselves will belong. And very catchy and may I say very well choreographed commercials bombard us all day telling us that the more we have, that we can have the most beneficial products for the least amount. More for less, a discounted price. You can have it all for nothing. What a bargain. Maybe if we have more and more things, we will feel more and more fulfilled, and yet the opposite remains true. What we seek to possess ends up possessing us. Friends, the gospel is not a bargain. I'm sorry to tell you that. But it is worth everything we have. To save your life, you must be willing to lose it. And those who lose their life for the gospel's sake and for the sake of Christ will save it. Ellen James, one of my dear new friends and members here, knows what it's like to lose something to save her soul. After years developing a successful catering business, Ellen seemingly had it all. Successful chef, growing reputation in the community, her friends admired her. But as she woke day after day at 4 a.m. to turn on her ovens to begin cooking meals for this successful business, she had tears in her eyes because she felt unfulfilled. 
Was this really all she could have? She dared to dream that something more fulfilling was possible. And despite a few raised eyebrows, I'm sure, she quit the catering business and started teaching wellness and exercise classes in our community. She knew that God had more for her, or should I say God had less for her? Less of the other stuff that was getting in the way of the gospel work. And now she and two other Wilshire members are beginning a new space called Into the Well, a risky new endeavor where all bodies can feel safe, an inclusive wellness space. Sounds like a holy investment to me. Jesus says that the work of salvation goes on in our willingness to give things up and join him in his suffering. And we must lose the notion that Christ died for us and we are no longer involved in the work of salvation. If salvation has already occurred on the cross and the price of sin has been paid, then what's the point of us being involved? Pop Christianity sees the cross as just another commodity to sell to the masses. And this misses so much of what true discipleship is really about. We can shift from bragging about the cross as a Christmas present and begin carrying it in our lives as a gift. It isn't easy to follow Jesus. And if it begins to feel easy, we must ask ourselves if it is indeed Jesus we are following. We will lose our privilege. We will lose our guaranteed place of authority in society. We will lose certainty. We will lose power. We will lose and we'll lose again and again and again. Some losses for the sake of the gospel will feel easy. That relationship you already knew was fizzling out. The job you've probably outgrown but some losses for the sake of Christ will feel harder. The wound you've been nursing for years but have not been healing. The bad mood that you've been in for about a decade too long. Your obsession with wealth and possessions, your comfort zone, your very best plan of how your life should go, your impatience, these things you might be called to lose. This is one I know well, losing the idea of who you thought you would be and how you thought your life would unfold. It's so hard to lose But Jesus shows us the way. Who do people say that he is? He is a mascot for American capitalism. He is the ticket to having more power, more influence, more money. He is just a very nice person. He is nice to people and works really hard. Now, is that gospel Or is it a decorative sign I recently saw at Target? (laughs) Those two messages shouldn't be so close. Or the looming perception of Jesus, which should also give us pause, that he's just irrelevant. Who do you say that he is? I say he is our teacher, our savior, our friend, our example, and he is worth us following. What if we practice saving our souls even more than we save for retirement? Our souls matter more, I promise you. What good is it if you gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? What good is it if you gain all the followers on social media and forfeit your soul? What good is it if you have millions of dollars in your bank account 
and forfeit your soul. What good is it if you have all the support of your political base and forfeit your soul? Christianity is a nonprofit in the truest sense. We are not trying to profit off of Jesus Christ. What a radical truth. Jesus is our Savior indeed. But I wonder what church would look like if we followed him as much as we praised him. Salvation looks like following. There is a big difference between being a fan of Jesus and being a follower of him. And this is the really hard part. We are up to the task, though. I know it. We can hold our lives, our possessions, our plans, our very bodily existence with a very soft grasp. Because none of it really belonged to us to begin with. We are stewards of all that God gives us. And in constantly letting go, we are constantly transformed. Walter Brueggemann says this, The world for which you have been so carefully prepared is being taken from you by the grace of God. By the grace of of God. God loves us enough to take from us the world we are conditioned to want. God wants less for you. Because God knows there is a life far more abundant. Paul sums it up quite well in his letter to the Philippians. I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Sounds like a holy investment to me. Amen.